1918. After four bitter years, the soldiers were coming home to Canada. The nation gave them a hero's welcome. People were proud of them and appreciated their sacrifices. But after the victory parades, life as usual seemed somehow a disappointment. Work was scarce, and those who found it were restless. They had lost the habit of long hours at the workbench. There were some who had to learn how to work. Others, crippled or gassed, would live out the rest of their lives in soldiers' homes. Disillusion brought the veterans back on parade, this time with petitions. Had their years of fighting not earned them a better life at home? Peace, for that matter, was still elusive. In Russia, the turmoil of war had led to violent revolution. Canadian soldiers were sent with other Western forces to oppose the Bolsheviks. The Communists won their fight, but they would always resent this outside interference. Interference worked both ways, and now the revolutionaries were calling for a world revolution of the working classes. This threat produced a red scare throughout the world. At ports of entry into Canada, Mounties searched for radical and seditious literature. In the panic, traditional liberties were endangered. Demonstrating veterans and workers were suspected of seditious conspiracy. Most wanted no more than an end to long hours and low wages. But as the growing unions tested their strength in strikes, they looked revolutionary. Strike leaders were arrested and jailed. Winnipeg was in a state of near siege as the first general strike in Canadian history spread to 30,000 workers. Armed conflict was narrowly avoided and the bitterness survived for years. When calm returned, changes were to come, not through revolution, but by free election. The same strike leaders were to fight for reforms in the legislatures. News of Laurier's death came in the midst of these troubled post-war days. The passing of the old chief was a reminder of a golden age of prosperity and westward expansion. In Ottawa, the Parliament buildings had been rebuilt after a fire, and the wartime government was in its last days. Severely tried by the post-war depression, it had already lost its wartime prime minister. Borden had gone, sick and disheartened. His successor, Arthur Meehan, was defeated in 1921, and the voters returned the Liberals. The Liberals had a new leader, Mackenzie King. In the nation at large, there was a feeling of new times ahead. Yes, Canada was on the move again, and at the wheel of an automobile with a tin Lizzie profile. People had a new assertiveness, though it sometimes got misdirected. Women were becoming more independent as Canadians became sophisticated city dwellers with a soft spot for the country. The speed limit was 35 miles an hour, and a tow rope was standard equipment. But as new highways were built, touring became a national recreation. Neighbors were drawn closer, and at the border, Canadians and Americans dedicated an arch. The theme was peace. But in faraway Chenac, Britain faced Turkey in dispute over the peace settlement. Mackenzie King refused to give support without the authority of the Canadian Parliament. The crisis passed, but Canada had shown she had reached the age for taking her own decisions. At the Imperial Conference of 1926, Mackenzie King argued his case. The Balfour Report tried to define on paper what the Commonwealth was gradually becoming in practice a group of self-governing nations, equal in status, in no way subordinate one to another in any aspect of their domestic or external affairs. Vincent Massey was sent to Washington as first Canadian minister abroad, a further step to full nationhood. The great post-war wave of immigrants had begun, the third in the nation's history. 
In the 20s, one and a half million settlers came from war-torn Europe, looking for a home and a chance to work in peace. Many moved west to complete the settlement of the wheatlands. A great new wheat boom rewarded the sodbusters, and they exulted in a record-breaking crop. To the north, too, there were lands to be opened up. It was time to define Canada's frontiers in the Arctic. Settlement and the presence of law gradually confirmed her sovereignty over half a million square miles of land. On her 60th birthday, Canada completed a tower on Parliament Hill dedicated to peace. The nation threw a party. A confident nation for whom the future seemed to hold promise of unending prosperity. Fortunate is he or she who is young in Canada today, rejoiced one writer. Canada had taken wing in more senses than one. For as early as 1920, the first flight had been made from ocean unto ocean. True, it had been completed in relays and it took 10 days, but with the challenge of its great open spaces and far-flung population, Canada hastened to master this new means of travel. Bush pilots like Doc Oakes, Punch Dickens and Wap May were leapfrogging prospectors and supplies far over the frozen wastes in search of future mines. The citizens of Halifax and Vancouver became close neighbors as the mailman descended from the skies. Canada soon led the world in volume of freight carried by air. The ocean-going ports bustled as the world's shoppers bought the harvests of Canada's mines, forests and farms. Canada was the world's biggest trader in wood products, wheat and nickel. In an easy-going mood, Canada repealed the prohibition on alcohol. The temperance groups protested, but the citizens cheerfully bought their first legal drink in years. Across the border, prohibition was still in effect, but faster than liquor could be poured down the drains, bootleggers from Canada came to the aid of their thirsty American cousins. Anchored off New York, outside the three-mile limit, the rum runners were met by cash-laden boats from shore. Canada had developed a profitable but embarrassing new export. And a new import. The Americans sent us jazz as people took to a fascinating toy called radio. Many considered that radio should provide something more than an unending repetition of hit tunes. they felt it could help to realize the dream of a distinctive Canadian identity. The dream was now becoming a reality in the arts. Hitherto, Canadian painters had been content to follow imported traditions. The group of seven now led a revolt. They proclaimed that Canada's northern landscape was unique. Their canvases were startling. Gone were the customary carbon copies of the European scene, Hot mush, cried the critics, but Canadian painters had won worldwide recognition. A growing band of native authors were also confounding the skeptics. Canadians, too, could contribute to the world's literature. Writing about things Canadian, some became world bestsellers. Even writers were sharing in the general prosperity. Prosperity it was. Onwards and upwards with the roaring twenties. True, the stores were bulging with stocks of unsold goods, but nothing that a little advertising would not cure, or so it seemed. Prosperity would go on forever, at least all the experts said so. The fun would go on forever too. A new game. Buy stocks and double your money. And an appropriate hit tune, This Is My Lucky Day. 
The market's booming. Become a millionaire. Everybody's doing it. Factories at full throttle. Plenty of work in mass production, so long as the people could go on buying. Prosperity guaranteed, so long as the world could pay for Canada's raw materials. How they hustled. So many orders to buy, feet were no longer fast enough. And then they skated into limbo. Black Tuesday, October 29th, 1929. The stock market collapsed like a house of cards. Panic ruled. Everybody called sell. Share prices had become inflated far above the real earning power of industry. The real crisis lay outside the stock exchange in an unhealthy, unbalanced world economy. When the crash came, millionaires went bankrupt overnight. So did companies and even countries. Suddenly, the world was poor. This was the Great Depression for millions of ordinary people who knew nothing of the stock exchange. An endless struggle for the privilege of earning their daily bread. Hundreds of thousands, face to face with starvation, were broken by the degrading handout. The popular song now was, Buddy, Can You Spare a Dime? Farmers lost everything. An impoverished world could not now afford to buy Canada's wheat, even at knockdown prices. To add to man-made folly, there came drought. Black blizzards carried off the parched soil, leaving a desert. The desperate farmer trekked to the city to join the unemployed. Thousands from the cities took to the road and toured their native land for the first time. The angry marched and demanded the right to work. Once again, there were ugly scenes between police and demonstrators, and new political parties were formed in protest. Whatever else they blamed, they blamed the government in office. Mackenzie King was suddenly the villain of the peace, charged with lacking a policy. Bennett took over with the promise to blast his way into the markets of the world. His magic cure was to protect Canadian industry by raising tariffs. Other countries were doing the same. This tariff war was already strangling international trade. To Canada came the statesmen of the Commonwealth to try and break the vicious circle. The Ottawa agreements set lower tariffs between the Commonwealth partners. It was hoped that these measures would revive trade and start the long climb out of the Depression. People still had the spirit to admire progress. Rooftops swarmed as the airship R-100 glided in from England carrying 100 passengers. A few realized that Canada was now closely linked with Europe. From out of that narrowing sky in 1933 came a group of Italian flyers It was the first time Canadians had seen the fascist salute, the salute of the dictatorships that had seized Italy and Germany. Montreal welcomed the visitors who boasted that Mussolini, like Hitler, had beaten the Depression. But most Canadians sought escape from their problems, not in drill, but in sport. What better than to dream of sailing away at the helm of the champion schooner Blue Nose? And a Canadian mother won a different kind of immortality. As the five Dion babies survived their first hours, the thoughts of millions were focused on Canada. For a moment, the world could forget the depression and the political storm clouds. But in the midst of celebrations, there were still protests. Voicing their discontent, the voters in 1935 dropped Bennett and again elected Mackenzie King. It fell to King to try and reunite an embittered generation. The recent Italian visitors were now on safari in Ethiopia. As they rained high explosives and poison gas on tribesmen armed with spears, 
the world discovered fascism's recipe for the depression. Now, surely, the League of Nations, formed to restrain aggression, would stay the hand of the bully. At Geneva, Haile Selassie pleaded for his country's life. As the League passed paper condemnations, Abyssinia was succumbing. Selassie's appeal was drowned by Mussolini's representative, and Canada's delegate had proposed a boycott of the aggressor. Ethiopia had some friends, but faced with the risk of having to keep the peace by force, the nations backed down. In Berlin at the 36 Olympics, the world had a first-hand view of how the Nazi fascist menace had grown in Germany. But like the rest of the world, Canadians were old-fashioned enough to regard the Olympic Games as a bridge of friendship. In deadly earnest, Hitler used the games to parade before the visitors the glory of the Third Reich, while its victims were being paraded out of sight in concentration camps. Too many failed to understand that they might be its next victims. At this crucial period, England and the Commonwealth were preoccupied with a domestic crisis. The new king, Edward VIII, wished to marry a divorced woman. Rather than divide his people, he abdicated without being crowned. George was less well known than his brother, but he was a family man, and later the image of the royal family encouraged a strong affection throughout the Commonwealth. The future queen looked on as her father assumed the duties of monarch to the Commonwealth's unique family of nations. As war again loomed, America's relations seemed as important to Canada as her Commonwealth ties. President Roosevelt, receiving an honorary degree from Queen's University, made clear where his sympathies would lie in any future war. I give to you assurance that the people of the United States will not stand idly by if domination of Canadian soil is threatened by any other empire. Spain, 1937, and a new weapon, mass bombing of cities. Franco waged civil war against the elected Republican government. Hitler and Mussolini sent him troops and arms. Britain and France pledged non-intervention. Some felt it was time to act. More than a thousand Canadians fought a losing battle alongside the Loyalists. But most people in the democracies were preoccupied with their day-to-day -day lives. In Canada, the Depression was passing, and a new generation could start thinking of jobs and careers. It began to look like a Hollywood ending, where everyone lives happily ever after. After long, drab years, Canadians delighted in the dream world of fashion. As sleepers sometimes do, they tried not to be awakened by the noises next door. And in the night, Hitler marched into Austria. He knew in advance that no one would lift a finger. The Nazis celebrated a bloodless victory in Vienna. Czechoslovakia was next on the list. England's Chamberlain and Francis Delagny met Hitler and Mussolini in Munich as the world tensed for war. Accepting Hitler's promise that this would be his last territorial claim, they gave way. Back in London, Chamberlain told a grateful people that he had brought back peace with honor, peace in our time. Hitler's generals were already laying plans to seize Poland. Later, it was said that Chamberlain had at least gained time, time to prepare. An awakened world now looked to its defenses. Canadians learned the bitter lesson that they did not live in a fireproof house, as they had once thought. There wasn't much time. The forces of the democracies were antiquated compared to Hitler's long-prepared war machine. Their fathers had fought in the last war, and soon it would be their turn. The war would wait for them to grow up. That summer of 39, young people enjoyed their last months of peace. It was only 21 years since armistice. Years of growth and expansion, depression and disillusion. In the midst of peace, why were they once more close to war?
the first reigning monarch to visit Canada was left in no doubt that Canada would stand with Britain in a fight against tyranny. As George VI dedicated a memorial to the last war, his words foreshadowed the conflict to come. Peace and freedom cannot long be separated. It is well that we have in one of the world's capitals a visible reminder of so great a truth. And without freedom, there can be no enduring peace, and without peace, no enduring freedom. <laughs>